I guess we can go right now to our food maven. That is Arthur Schwartz, who joins us every Monday live. We broadcast it, of course, on the weekends and uh, on Tuesday, just after the noon hour, as a matter of fact. So, ladies and gentlemen, with further ado, here he is, Arthur Schwartz. Good morning, Arthur. Good morning. Good morning. And it's cold, and it's still winter, even though it's spring. And yeah. the flowers are up, and I'm sort of in a winter mode. Yeah. Well, well, we have snow. Fl- we, we have snow flurries here, so you know. And I get. I know. I know. Well, it was. I, I was scared because two, three years ago, I don't remember. Time goes so fast. Um, there was a frost exactly now, just as the magnolias were about to burst, and there were no magnolias. So uh, it only got down to thirty-four degrees here in Brooklyn. So that I'm, I'm okay. We're okay. The magnolias are okay. All right. And I'm prepared. <laughs> uh, what do I mean is, I don't know. I need, I'm, I'm doing a major overhaul over here. And in the midst of all this, I decided I needed comfort because food for me is comfort. Both, I, I realized, think about it, it's both the cooking of it and the eating of it. Yeah. But the thought of eating it motivates me to cook it. <laughs> And then once I get into it, I find it, you know, the, the process rather zen. But um, I've been yearning, no better word, to make a old-fashioned, and I mean Italian-American, yeah, some people in Italy would do it too, uh, kind of uh, meat sauce, ragu, made with spare ribs. And there were these great-looking spareribs in the case the other day. And I said, okay, it'll give me an excuse to sit in the kitchen and rest my back from all the schlepping and um, lifting, et cetera, that I've been doing. Well, I could do a little of that in between. It was a good balance of lifting and schlepping with sitting by my ragu. So as John... Carola Francescone, the queen of Neapolitan cooking, dead about 20 years now, at least. Yeah, 20 years. Um, As she said, when you make a ragu, which requires hours and hours of simmering, get a good book, sit by the pot, but don't make it such a good book that you forget to stir the pot every 15, 20 minutes. (laughs) So that's what I did. Except that instead of reading a book, I schlepped uh, stuff. Um, and, 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 you know, the eating of this is, is uh, it only took one day to make, but it took, it's taking three days to consume. So that's not a bad <laughs> no. uh, uh, investment, right? No, that's a good investment. Yeah. So, um, and it's the plainest of plain. Uh, this sauce I made the other day is not strictly Italian-American because I cook with enough Italian-American uh, grandmas and I'm a, a grandma, grandpa age myself, so you can imagine that a lot of them from the old country. But when they came to the new country, ingredients were different, Things were more, some things were more abundant, other things not. And um, and, they, and and the American thing, not just among Italians, uh, but of other ethnicities and and uh, national uh, descent, we add a lot of stuff to what was a, at one time an impoverished, simple, beautiful, beautiful uh, cooking. So I made the simplest possible ragu the other day. But if I was an old Italian grandma who didn't really like the taste of the tomatoes she could buy here, um, and and maybe you know that's why the Italians started putting up their own tomatoes. Footnote: Get back to that later. Um, you know, you added garlic and onion. Where at home, maybe you only had only had the onion, and you added uh, 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 oregano and parsley. And you had every meat in the book. And that was Sunday gravy, called Sunday gravy. Um, I made Simple Simple. Start out with a little over two pounds of pork spare ribs. 
not the expensive baby backs, not plain old pork spare ribs. There are, uh, these days, there's so many different spare ribs in the, in the case. You just want the plain old spare ribs. I, I, you know, if, if they're, sometimes they're on sale and you can buy a whole rack for practically nothing. But the other day in the supermarket, they had them, these really nice ones, already cut up. So I didn't even have to do that. And they were at a very reasonable price. So it was a little over two pounds. I put that into a big pot, meaning a pot that um, where, where most of them will fit in one layer. Maybe there'll be a couple or so that aren't quite there. But this is not French cooking. So they don't have to, the goal here is not to make everything beautifully brown. It's just to start the cooking and, um, and, and to get some color on them but not like you would if you were making a, a stew. Um, so this is ragu. And then, so over medium-high heat, I, I, I turned in, in, uh, these ribs in just a tiny bit of olive oil to skim the bottom of the pot so they didn't stick. And it took about 10 minutes using tongs, turning them, blah, blah, blah. And then I added um, a one medium onion. Medium, not a large onion, a, a, a six-ounce onion, uh, diced. I, I added that to the pot, and then I continued to cook it a few more minutes until the onion wilted very nicely. Um, and then I added about two-thirds of a cup of red wine. I happened to have that much in the bottle <laughs> on my counter. Um, you could use a half a cup. You could leave the wine out altogether you really, really want, but I don't see why you would want unless you just didn't have any in the house. Um, and anyway, a half a cup would be fine. And by the way, if you want to, if you have some leftover white wine somewhere, <laughs> you can use that instead of the red wine. And let the wine, whichever, cook until it's to- totally or almost totally evaporated. And then I added two cans of a uh, 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 San Marzano tomatoes, I, I poured them into a bowl first, and I mash mine up these days with a potato masher, but you could use your hands to crush them in the bowl, that's good too, and add them to the pot with all the, you know, puree these days, these tomatoes come with puree. People ask me about draining tomatoes, because back when I wrote Naples at Table 20 some odd years ago, uh, we had, didn't have such good tomatoes in the market. The best tomatoes came packed in juice, and uh, you did have to drain them, because if you didn't drain them, you'd be cooking your tomato sauce forever uh, to, to evaporate this juice. But these days, they come packed in puree, even, you know, like uh, uh, domestic tomatoes, red pack, comes yeah. packed in puree. Um, and then pour that into the um, a pot. I rinse out my cans, so I do add some water. I rinse out the cans with some water to get all the flavor out of the cans. It's sometimes at the end you're going to add a little water, too. It depends on how bubbly, bubbly, how simmering uh, you keep the sauce. And you stir that in, uh, some salt and pepper to start. I would say a teaspoon of salt and maybe not even the pepper at this point. Get the pepper. We'll do it later. No herbs. It's just meat, onion, tomatoes. And you let that simmer for minimum two hours and 15 minutes. Two hours and a half. I have friends in Naples who would say that's only semi-ragu. You need to cook it four or five hours. I, these days, I like a tiny bit of freshness and two and a half hours is plenty for me. <laughs> These spare ribs will have rendered quite a lot of fat. Um, makes the sauce so velvety. It's delicious fat. Um, and the meat will be falling off the bones. So I, the first night, um, you eat the meat. Or if it's a big feast day kind of thing, you know, you could eat the meat and, and the sauce in the same day. But um, I, I pretty much serve the meat. Uh, with sauce clinging to it, and uh, and vegetables, 
And then you have enormous amounts of really dense uh, meat sauce at, with the, you know, it's got that fat in it. And uh, uh, that'll stay in the fridge for well, you know, a week. But I would freeze it, um, and I have. We had it um, on, on pasta one night, um, and, um, and then I froze the other, the rest of it into, in two portions. So that's for us, who eat a lot. <laughs> that was three days, three meals, three big meals. I mean, I, there's no meat involved anymore because we ate the meat. How, but, how, um, pardon me? I was just going to say, how long will what you froze, how, how long will you keep it? Oh, months. Okay. Months. Fact is, um, we get, you know, as the weather gets warmer, I'm not going to want to eat this very right. much. I prefer to have a, a real tomato sauce, meaning no meat. And, and that's a very briefly cooked sauce. But I want to point out that the word ragu, R A G U, really means meat sauce. It doesn't mean the ground meat sauce of Bologna. Um, a bolognese. Um, uh, it doesn't, not specifically. It, uh, it means any meat sauce. And if it's not a, a tomato based meat sauce, um, it's just tomatoes without the meat, then it's sauce. Okay, let me it's not, ask you, it's okay. not ragu, it's not, it's not so called uh, gravy, uh, 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 grandma's gravy, mama's gravy is made with meat. Now, how did they get the name ragu on the on the on the on the, on the marinara sauce? Because you would figure that would well, have been marinara a, sauce is something totally different. Yeah, but the name ragu is is. Are you are you talking about the brand name yeah, ragu? Yeah, I mean that you would figure that ragu has been around a long time that you wouldn't be able to make that a brand name. Well, it's spelled well, why not? I don't know. I mean, I mean that I, I grew up with ragu, so it's. As old as me, I don't know how old it is. We, we could that we, up, Jill. We, we, when uh, we wanted to trademark Robin Hood, we couldn't. We had a tra- we we could oh, trade, really we could trademark Robin Hood Radio what our image is, but we couldn't. Tra- we could trademark Robin Hood Radio dot com actually, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. otherwise, it, because Robin Hood's in the public. But, but the so problem you would think is, Ragu would be in the public domain. No, because no. it's a word. We couldn't. Okay. We, we we had trouble. The the reason we got into difficulty. We're talking nineteen twenty something. But but also ragu is a word. It, you know, it's the French is R A G O U T, and ragu is become um, the, the pasta. It's you know it's an Italian word. Hmm. Right. So the, just it just means meat sauce. You can't you can't trademark words. As our problem with Robin Hood Radio was you couldn't trademark Didn't radio. Did Trump try to uh, trademark? You fired, <laughs> and he couldn't. Did he? What's this? He did. He did years yeah, ago. Yeah, he did. He tried, and he couldn't. That's a, I don't know why he couldn't, but I'm glad he couldn't. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, you can make ragu with any meat. So my next yearning, um, my new word, <laughs> is to make a ragu with lamb. Now, up in the mountain, and goats, a, go- a goat ragu is sensational if you get good goat. Um, I live in a place in here in Brooklyn where you can get good goat. Um, you know, we have a huge Caribbean community. Next yeah. Door. And so every so often some get The other loose. end of the park. Pardon me? I said every so often. Never mind. This is like... Every so often what? Oh, the, the goat gets loose. If the goat gets loose, by the way, it's it's uh, free for all. It's, uh, oh, a goat did get loose, didn't it? But it wasn't here in Brooklyn. Where was it? I don't know. It was a goat. I don't know. But we have goats in the in Prospect Park. It was um, on the Grand Central Park. They bring in park. goats... Um, to eat the weeds. Yeah, it, they're and, very efficient. Uh, they fence them in into in, in a large tract, and the goats eat everything in sight. And um, I think they actually brought them in for the first time. Believe, is this possible? I, or I, am I not remembering correctly? They brought them in to eat the poison ivy. Yeah, is that possible? It's possible. Yeah, after some huge storm where we lost some trees. Um, it, it made it uh, more amenable to poison ivy at the edges of the uh, wood. And, um, yeah, they had to bring in, I think that was it, they brought in the goats. But now they do them every summer. They bring in goats to some portion. Do they have an the armed park. guard? I don't think, no. I don't know. Do they have a goat herd? 
Just, just, I'm just I have no idea. I'm, I'm sure they must have somebody who checks in on them. Obviously, uh, because otherwise but, the, uh, the I, Caribbean I, I, community would be... I've uh, the goats once, and they were fenced in, and there was no, no security guard or anything like that. I mean, the park is pretty safe. I mean, I think the, the worst you would have to worry about is some kid, um, child, <laughs> not, ah. not goat, <laughs> not goat kid, yeah. but, but human kid, <laughs> gets somehow in trouble by maybe even climbing the fence. It's not it's a chain link fence, though. No, it's, it's okay. The temporary fence. A selfie with a goat is not the same as a selfie with a jaguar. An idiot. Right. I mean, goats are extremely lovable. Totally. And cute. Yeah. Okay, the goat was found on uh, in the Bronx. Yeah, the <laughs> goat was the goat got loose and the goat you know, goat won. And a loose cow was uh, was, was on, on the... loose in Jamaica. <laughs> well, um, when I first moved to Brooklyn, which is now over oh, twenty years ago I shouldn't say moved to Brooklyn, I should say moved back to Brooklyn <laughs> over twenty years ago. Um, uh, people in Manhattan who just didn't get it. Uh, now they get it. Uh, they didn't get it. They said, you know, why, why were you living where you live? And I said, because down the street is a place that makes mozzarella twice a day. <laughs> and uh, on the other end of the park, I can buy a goat. <laughs> <laughs> you know. um, and I can still buy goat. Curried goat is a Brooklyn dish at this point. <laughs> and, by the way, if you're from the Caribbean, there, it's a new, there's new one. You know, there's Trinidadian curry, there's Jamaican curry, um, there's Bajan curry. Uh, everybody's got their uh, curry and their curry powder from their island. So you go to a grocery here, um, you, can, you, you have such a, a variety of curry powders, uh, you don't know where to start. So you have to... You have to ask the lady who's standing next to you, but, which one do you buy and what island do you from? <laughs> yeah. And then and then you have a selection. We just heard from a listener who said, basically, goats definitely eat poison ivy and poison oak. There you go. Very effective uh, and efficient. Their poop helps the soil. Uh, the, you know, so Good morning. we're very uh, sustainable here. <laughs> sustainable sustainable parkland. That could be a, an April Fool's joke. It isn't. Um, we we have a great park here. Um, uh, I don't know what, what was the last time you came to Prospect Park, but it's an extremely active park. Uh, and um, I always wonder, there are so many three-month-old babies in the neighborhood, and the mamas and the papas. Actually, we, I always called uh, another name for Park Slope is Daddies with Strollers. Uh, uh, they're all they all congregate in the park. It tells you that so last spring. That, so what exactly a month uh, a year ago? But, right, exactly. There was a lot of copulation going. On. It's called spring. I know, but it, you know, I never think about it in terms of humans. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe but, you want to start. <laughs> but but, but um, you're you know, a spring baby. Word? Woodcocks. We have um, um, yesterday. They, all the bird watchers went to uh, Floyd Bennett Field, which is at the south end of Brooklyn on Jamaica Bay. And I understand there's some kind of museum, air, air museum or something there now, but um, people went there yesterday because the woodcocks were doing their uh, mating swirls in the sky. Um, I wonder if I could look that up on the Internet see it, because I didn't get to uh, Floyd Bennett Field yesterday, but I heard there was a big bird-watching thing going on, uh, people with their telescopes, whatever. Um, anyway, so we, uh, I do, you know, it's a big nature, it's actually a, a, a national park along the shore of Brooklyn. Um, I forget what they call it. Does anybody remember what they call it? Uh, no. Um, no. It, it, it encompasses um, um, all the way from well, it's the whole the whole shore facing the Rockaways. It's very nice. Birds, who knows what kind of critters? Uh, but I'm not eating those things. Okay. Yeah. And no grouse and no quail. They're, 
probably are. I used to go foraging um, uh, along there. Where there, I know what I can. I know what I can pick. Uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of um, a, a wild tarragon. I don't know why. Um, all kinds of herbs. Just let's just say all kinds of herbs. This time of the year, well, not in Sharon, but um, coming up very soon in Sharon. Um, uh, things are going to be popping up, including um, uh, various kinds of cress. Uh, so if you live near a stream, I would look for the watercress, which um, somebody on television just said, this is, and I'm saying it that way because I, don't, I haven't done the research myself, and I, I'm not sure I believe it, um, that watercress is like the most, it's the biggest power, nutritional powerhouse that you can eat. But you hear that about a lot of things. That's how the kale thing got going. I know. You know? Holy yeah. thyroid. So that I don't know if watercress is the next kale. It's very possible. It's it's just it it, it, it just really so, a t- totally a, a, a digression. Is uh, uh, some friends had uh, dinner at a really fancy place in Chicago, um, and that, that's noted for his food. And they there was a, a, a lamb item on the menu. And what was presented was so different from the item on the menu and was so overcomplicated and so unattractive and just <laughs> took basic, you know, the, the, the upshot of the tale, T-A-L-E, was can we get back to just because of TV and everything, the more complicated, the more steps. No, this is a really good tasting thing, and this is how to make it taste really good by leaving it alone. It's just well, this is a function of age, as Frank Bruni pointed out in a in a op ed on Sunday. Um, if you're over fifty. You have one taste, and if you're under 50, you have another taste. And he's always talking about going to restaurants. Um, uh, and he he wants he wants he you know if you're over 50, you go to the same restaurant all the time <laughs> because they take care of you, and you can depend on the food and yada yada. Yeah, um, it was ever thus, and but, it will ever but, be and thus. It's the same with the kind of food. I mean, the older we get the more simple we appreciate. Let's put it that way. Well, we if you have a club, the older that we get, the more consistent we like. Uh, we like and more things. consistent, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. And, and, and the thing Which that, is why I find myself going, I, I go to the same places all the time. Right. And, uh, I, and But, of course, I don't want to travel very much either. I like to be able to walk out of my house and go somewhere or even get in the car in 10 minutes I'm there. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't find... I Well, let me say... I find myself in a particular situation where my job for 35 years was to go to new restaurants. And I couldn't wait until that was over because it sounds like a dream job, but I'm, you've got to remember that two-thirds of the places you go to are terrible. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and, 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 then, and then the good ones you never get to go back to. Right. I was going to say being Because you've got to keep moving on. Being a food critic is kind of like being a music teacher in the elementary school. <laughs> you got to love music because the music you hear when you teach it is terrible except for one or two people. Yeah, and, well, there and, you go. And right. food's the same way. It is the same. It is the same. <laughs> we, I actually, I, I used to have this discussion with Howard Kissel, who was the late, late, great, great, uh, a theater critic of uh, several newspapers, but we worked together at the Daily News for years. Like, who had the worst job? <laughs> he who had to go to see terrible theater, and, or I who had to go and eat terrible food, or be treated terribly by some service idiot. Right. No, it's... Uh, it's you know, and it's, it was a toss-up, although, as I kept saying to him, I have to ingest the badness. <laughs> you could just go to sleep. <laughs> Um, uh, so now, of course, I want consistency, but it's also a function of age. It definitely is. I'm, and I I'm all for age. And now the early bird special, although I prefer to call it lunch. Exactly. I, I just call it late lunch. Uh, is it totally? Or even early lunch. It's still, <laughs> it's still, still lunch. Of the day. Still, uh, Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge, is that it? 
Jamaica Bay Wild Refuge. Yes, but it is a, a something or other national. It is. Uh, it park. is a Gateway National Recreation. That's uh, it. A ga- Gateway National Recreation Park. Right. Uh, Gateway so National all Recreation kinds of activities Area. Activities at Gateway Park, including apparently bird watching. No, I knew about the. It's bird Audubon. Watching. It is part of uh, Jamaica Bay Wildlife. Thank you. This is internet. This is New York City Audubon. Uh, U.S. Department of Interior's only wildlife refuge administered by the National Park Service. There you go. All other national refuges fall under the aegis of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. That's pretty interesting. Interesting, yeah. 9,000 acres, 20 square miles, open bay, salt marsh, mud flats, upland field, and woods, etc. So I was a boy bicyclist, and so I know this uh, stretch uh, very, very well. Uh, because there's a bike path that goes through it. And uh, it's a sensational bike path. Um, you know, you do see all kinds of wildlife along the way. So all of you bikers out there, um, come to Brooklyn. We also have a bike path, an urban bike path, from Prospect Park all the way to Coney Island. And it, it, it's a bike path that's on Ocean Parkway. It, it's designated. It's uh, it's not in the traffic. It's on the park strip. That it's a, you know Ocean Parkway is a true French style boulevard with park strips um, that um, and with little side roads. That's where the houses are. In the middle is this multi lane Ocean Parkway, but it's called a Parkway because there are parks and on. Uh, and there is a bike lane that goes all the way to Coney Island, and we over have, the ocean. We have a a uh, what they call a, a nature trail, which is all paved and bike and everything, that runs basically from uh, Amenia, New York, and it will, at the end of the summer, run all the way up to Copac, New York, and then over and into um, um, the other side of the Hudson River. All in all. It'll be like forty-eight miles of contiguous path from, from really bike the, path, a bike path and a walking path. So yeah. let me ask the vital question for me: Does it go up any hills? It goes up hills, but the way it's it's designed in old railway old railway beds that are all cut out, and they just work on them. They flatten them out, and yes, there's some hills up and down. Have you ever been to uh, the in Poughkeepsie the old railroad bridge? It is now one of the major attractions in New York State that they did over with concrete, oh. and it's a walking path that goes over the Hudson River, and it's spectacular, and a bike path as well. Spectacular. I'll walk, I'll walk over the Hudson. Um, yeah, I have, you know, I live in Park Slope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so even here, it's well, hard we heard, we to heard, do the hills. We heard you can walk on water anyway. That's right. We also, uh, I had a friend who lived in Brooklyn and uh, just loved ocean. Ju- I just loved that uh, uh, stretch of bike riding. Just loved oh, it. Oh, yeah, no, and it's flat. <laughs> flat right. and wonderful and beautiful. You're, and go, you're going through neighbors called Flatbush yes. and Flatland. Hooray. <laughs> Those are Dutch names. Before you went to Park Slope. All right. All right. And then, and, yeah, Park, but Park Slope is a new name. Park Slope didn't exist as a name until the late uh, 19th century. Late, late 19th? Yeah, late, uh, uh, yeah, late 19th century, of course. All right. Okay, so, um, so you know, also, by the way, when you have ragu in the freezer, you feel very secure. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was what I was asking originally. You All know, right. it's, yes, I do. I feel very secure because yeah. I know I, I, can just, I, can, I can even defrost it in the microwave, uh, uh, simmer it another minute. You usually have to correct salt and pepper when you reheat from the freezer. And, um, and it's spaghetti for dinner. Who can complain? That's it. All right. All right. Have a great week, everybody. And let's hope it's more spring-like next Monday. All right. Yes, let's. Take care, Arthur. Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, here on Robin Hood Radio, robinhoodradio.com on the web.
Underwriting support for Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, John Andrews Restaurant on the Hillsdale Road in South Egremont, 413-528-3467, and on the web, jarestaurant.com. Rubiner's Cheesemongers and Grocers on Main Street in Great Barrington, 413-528-0488, rubiner's.com. Hillsdale Home Chef with two beautiful teaching classes, and they've got classes to go in those cooking rooms. More information, 518-325-7000, hgshomechef.com. And Haven Cafe in Lenox, Massachusetts, offering quality food and excellent service. Also, they feature catering. Supporting local organic farmers, environmentally conscious, and epicurious distributors, havencafebakery.com. 